Today I'm going to keep it light and simply give my personal reflection and insight on Hebrews chapter 2. Anybody hear that? Day is full to everybody. Before I begin, let's start by renewing our consecration and asking for Mary's intercession. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Immaculata, Queen and Mother of the Church, I renew my consecration to you this day and for always, so that you may use me for the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ into the world. To this end, I offer you all my prayers works, joys, and sufferings of this day. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to you, to you, and for all those who do not have recourse to you, especially enemies of the Church and the Masons. Allow me to praise you, O Sacred Virgin. Give me strength against your enemies. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, usually I talk about some issue affecting us today, uh, usually uh, some moral or social or political issue. But I thought today I would just give uh, a, l- a little bit of reflection and insight into some a scripture verse that I was reading uh, as part of my, uh, my prayer time. And what I'm going to do here is simply read through this section first and then kind of go back over it. Uh, a little piece by piece, and uh, kind of share with what I got from it. Now, this is from Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verse 5 through 18. And the title of the top of this is Exaltation to Abasement. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou carest for him. Thou didst make him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the pioneer of salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have all one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will praise thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I, and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. For surely it is not with angels that he is concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make expiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Now, this part of scripture begins by continuing the distinction between man and angels. Because in the previous chapter, 
St. Paul, the writer of Hebrews, is pointing out that God has a certain preference for mankind over the angelic, a certain um, honor that is bestowed upon man through Jesus Christ. Now, in the beginning of this, he says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. Now, the world to come. Now, what I'm getting from this is, and like I said, I'm not looking at a, a commentary or anything like that, so anyone out there has a commentary that maybe counteracts what I'm saying, that's fine. This is just my what I got from it, just from reading it, a personal insight interpretation, so I can be wrong. Um, but the world to come is like we say in the creed. We believe in the world to come. It's that new creation, that new heaven, that new earth. And Paul is pointing out that God will create that place, that he brings it into his rule, his control, not for the sake of the angelic, not for angels, but for our sake. So he's this place that is prepared uh, in the world to come that we don't really know much about um, is specifically a place prepared for mankind, for our salvation. So when we, if we run the race, we keep the faith, and we enter the eternal life, and then when we finally get to see that new earth, that new creation, all of that, everything in our lives now and to come, all has the focus of mankind. It's for our salvation. The reason we po- I feel like that's an important statement is because, remember, the angels are pure spirits. So, according to the order of creation, they're higher than us. Because to have flesh is to be subject to change and decay, right? Uh, the angels don't change. They are spirits. Spirits don't have a body to change. So, here he is saying, these higher beings are in some sense subjected to us. And we're going to get more into that and get into this a little bit further. But they are being subjected to us, which through our creation are technically lower than them. So God's kind of raising us up. Now, how that happens, he goes into further. Now, this, the verse he's, St. Paul's giving us is further proving his, uh, his point here. He's going to relate us to Jesus, but first he's going to point out that Jesus is God and is the one subjecting everything. So when he says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou carest for him? Thou didst make for him Make him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subject under his feet. See, he's quoting that, and then he's basically asking, who is who is that referencing? Who is the he that is subjecting everything? Well, he's pointing out that, see that, that verse I just gave you? Well, that's Jesus. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, Jesus, he left nothing outside his control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We don't understand, is what Paul's saying. We don't see it. We don't necessarily understand it completely. We get little glimpses. But what we do see, what we do have to go off of, is Jesus himself. In verse 9, he says, But we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. So he's referencing back to that scripture verse. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. You see, he's referencing Jesus back to that scripture verse. And he's also pointing out that even though we don't understand the world to come, what it is exactly, what we do understand, at least somewhat, is Jesus himself because he was in flesh. So so that's what he means, but we see Jesus. And then he says, and Jesus, he was made low for a little while, below the angels, just like the scripture verse is referencing. And just like that scripture verse is referencing, everything would be made subje- into subjection under his feet. How? Through suffering and death. You see, Paul gives evidence for Jesus being the one who subjected the world to come and how he uplifts man. Now, how is Jesus glorified is the question, right? That's, that's an important part to focus on here. He is glorified through suffering and t- by tasting death. Now, St. Paul is going to continue with relating relating Jesus to us now, okay, how we are to be like Jesus. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, he being Jesus, and 
bringing many sons to glory, should make the pioneer of, of their salvation perfect through suffering. The pioneer of their suffering. The there, who, who's he talking about? All of us. Our pioneering, our pilgrimage is on earth, and that is made perfect through suffering. Why? Because he suffered. His, and he took suffering, and instead of suffering and, and pain, doing something to us, right? As if it's almost like an outside force enacted upon us and kind of strips, strips us of something. Instead, here he's saying Jesus took it and turned it around, turned it into a means of glory, a means of obtaining perfection. Now it becomes almost a servant, or you could say a weapon. Now whatever's thrown at us gets turned into a means of obtaining salvation. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have all one origin. That's us. See, we are being sanctified. He is the sanctifier. We are being sanctified, and we all have one origin. And who is that origin? That's what these quotes mean. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. I will put my trust in him. Here am I and the children God has given me. The children, the brethren, that's us. So Jesus is identifying us with himself. So he's saying, see how I suffered and die, right? See how uh, through pain and suffering, I'm given glory, right? That's how you are to obtain that glory, through suffering and death. And hopefully through that, you obtain perfection. It is through that suffering that you obtain the crown. You know, you win the race. You run the race so as to win. Now, the next part of this, he mentions uh, children share in flesh and blood. And this is a reference, I believe, to the Eucharist. Because how can you share in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ if you are not receiving the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ? He even says that in John 6. If you wish to have life in you, you must eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood. Okay? The Son of Man, I believe he says. So even though we are, as Christians, we're all brethren through baptism, and that's a point I want to get across, because if you're not baptized, you're not truly a child of God. A child of God is one who is baptized. That's when you are born into the kingdom. Yet when you reject the Eucharist, the sacraments, the church, you are, in a sense, rejecting your adoption into the family of God. I'll put it to you this way. It's like being adopted into a family and then you run away from home. You're still technically, because of that adoption, the child of that husband and wife. But in another sense, you have separated yourself from that family. So you're part of the family in one way, but in another way, you're kind of not. And that's also why we reference Protestants and other non-Christians as separated brethren. It's almost like an oxymoron in a sense. Because, like I said, they're family in the sense that they're uh, baptized. That's the adoption process. But they've rejected their own adoption. They rejected it by the fact they reject the sacraments, specifically this one, uh, the Eucharist. Because it says right here, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature. So we cannot partake in Jesus' divine nature if we are not sharing in his flesh and blood. Now, next here it says Jesus partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. So here it is, Jesus is not ignorant of suffering and temptation because he has shared in our flesh and blood and has shared in our suffering and has shared in temptation. Because of all of that, he is able to extend endless mercy. Jesus knows our sufferings, not in some abstract sense, but in a very real sense. And that's, you know, that's why I keep going back to the usage of the words flesh and blood. He knows it in the flesh, in the blood. He has shed blood. He knows what it is to be mocked. He knows what it is to be standing there in front of a bunch of people that, you know what? He's Jesus. He's God, right? He knows more than they do. He is uh, intelligence and knowledge 
itself. He is the divine reason, divine logic, right? And here are these people talking down to him like he's an idiot. So he knows what it's like to be among those who are so, you just can't understand. They cannot grasp truth and understanding. And then they're mocking you for it. And they're mocking you in a way that makes them seem as though they somehow know better than you. Right? So Jesus knows what it is to be mocked, even when he's right. Even when uh, you're surrounded by people who are maybe uh, not as moral, not as uh, reasonable, not as intelligent, maybe. Uh, so Jesus knows what it is to be in those situations. He also knows what it is to be physically assaulted and to be meek. And I like, uh, I think it was Jordan Peterson who talked about meek being a sheathed sword. Jesus Christ could strike every single one of them down, but he endures it. And probably, and we could speculate as to why and this kind of thing, but he endures it because he could easily strike them down. It's like, um, like the master and the student. And then if the student strikes out in anger, the master doesn't immediately draw his sword and cut him down, right? Because, simply because he is the master. He knows what he could do to the student. And he knows how far below he, uh, the student is. And so he keeps that, so that sword sheathed and he endures. Now that doesn't mean Jesus never stood up for anything, never spoke out, never lashed out. He spoke very angrily in Matthew towards the, uh, the Pharisees. You know, the woes, if you read those, that's some pretty damning remarks, especially when it's not just a guy yelling out in anger. This is the God of the universe looking directly at those Pharisees and telling them, woe unto you. He's speaking with authority, divine authority. So that's it's interesting to read the woes because that that should put some uh, hair on you. You know, that should scare you. Now, this uh, part of scripture ends with it ends with him saying G um, he, Jesus, can help us in our temptation, meaning he does not just leave us in our sins. Let me just read that directly. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren, us in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make expiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Now, that does not mean, you know, mercy and helping those who are tempted. That does not mean he leaves you in your sin. That does not mean that, well, you know, hey, Jesus understands. He, he gets it, so I'm okay. No big deal. No, he calls us to repentance and conversion. He calls us away from sin and to himself. The idea that he can help you in your weakness says he's helping you what? You know, help means going from something, right? So he's helping you to come out of that sin. Mercy does not mean justice ceases to exist. It doesn't cancel it out. That his mercy is endless does not mean, well, his justice is limited. Justice will always happen. You're always going to get what's owed to you because of your, the good or the sin you have committed. Either one. And we've committed a lot more sin than good. So... Because he himself was tempted, and he himself partakes of our nature, we in turn are able to partake of his nature, and thus we are raised above the angels, not according to the order of creation, but according to the order of grace, through Jesus Christ and the participation in his flesh and blood. Now, us Catholics who are in mortal sin, you can't receive communion. Those of us who rebel from the church can't receive communion. Those who will not submit to the authority of the church, cannot receive communion. And if you are receiving communion in such a state, you're eating and drink condemnation upon yourself. You're not participating in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. You're participating in your own damnation at that point. Remember, we participate in the divine nature of God. We become, once we pass from this life to the next, deified, right? We become like God. Not big G, but we become, we become like a little G. We resemble God so much, so perfectly, as perfectly as we can, according to our state. So when we deny ourselves partaking in the Eucharist, and I would also add, when we deny ourselves partaking in Scripture, because the Eucharist is the body of Christ sacramentally, right? It's the flesh of Jesus Christ. Well, the Scriptures is the body of Christ written. It's the Word of God. And so those go hand in hand. So when we deny ourselves 
participation in Christ Jesus. We deny ourselves participation in life itself, the true, the good, the beautiful, the way, the truth, and the life. We, in a re- very real sense, are killing ourselves. Anyway, I guess I'm going to end it there. That's what I got from this reading. And it it really brings the rest of Scripture to life for me and seems to point directly to a Catholic understanding of Scripture. I think these are, I may be mistaken, but I think these are called the Catholic letters. I may have that mixed up. There's some letters that are called the Catholic letters, and I may be getting those mixed up with this. But but either way, it's it's very Catholic in its understanding. So thanks for joining me today. Stay strong in the faith. Deus Volt. Remember God, family, community, country. Usquad Morty.